Mailbag. Nothing personal. Word of the day is mailbag. We've got another mailbag episode for you. Don't get sick of them. You follow nothing personal. You have so many questions, and I love answering them. And I am right now somewhere knee deep in Africa having some sort of trip. Hopefully, you're following it on Twitter. We've recorded these, so you have some content while I'm away and while Coca is still working, doing some nothing personal stuff, doing some Cover 3, which is a great podcast on CBS Sports that he, he runs as well but I think his true love is nothing personal. Mailbag is when you follow our show. Get to me on Twitter at David P. Sampson or get a review on Apple and write a question in the review. I just want to start because we have an interesting topic today. He puts them into themes. Have you noticed that with the mailbags that have been released while I've been away? They're themes. I don't really know what they are. He just shows me the questions and says, think about it and start talking. Hi, David. Hi. I greatly admire how marathon runners can get in a zone and train themselves to perform above and beyond what a great majority of humans will ever be able to do. I basically don't run unless I'm chasing something, like a tennis ball or a hockey puck, or if something's chasing me like a dog. I've heard that marathon runners sometimes need to expel waste while running because you really can't stop. Let me stop you there. If you're not paid to run marathons, you can stop. Let me keep going. I'm wondering if you'd share the most traumatic thing you've ever seen while running, or more interesting, the most traumatic thing that you had to endure while running. I want to talk a little bit about the mentality of marathon running. One of the things that I'm trying to do in Africa, after climbing and summiting Mount Kilimanjaro, trying to run a marathon from the summit, it's the world's highest marathon. And the winner of the race that I'm entering into actually will set a record and will be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest marathon from the highest point. Because this race starts over 19,000 feet. I have no idea how I'm gonna be doing this. So I wanna talk about the mentality of why I do things, much to the chagrin of my family and friends who point out your hamstrings torn because you're old. What are you doing? Why do you keep having to prove yourself? And that's a whole nother subject that we're gonna talk about later in this show, I hope when we talk about therapy. But my marathon career started in 1996 on a wager. Someone bet me and my best friend, Brett, that we couldn't run a marathon, the New York Marathon, which is the first Sunday in November. And it was March of 1996. I was 28 years old and I was out of shape. I was working and I had not, I was at Morgan Stanley at the time And actually, I likely was at News Travels Fast. I was likely delivering newspapers in Europe when this wager happened. We went to the reservoir in New York City, which is 1.4 miles around, and we could not run a mile. We could not make it around the reservoir. And we looked at each other and said, well, wait a minute, this makes no sense, right? We've got to be able to do better. And we went online and we got a marathon training program from Hal Higdon, and it's halhigdon.com. This is free advertising for you, Hal, but you deserve it. You've been helping me for, God, it's now 26 years. And we did not miss a training workout. Do you know that you can run a marathon if you've got the discipline to train for it? It's not as though you have to train yourself to dunk a basketball or train yourself to hit a baseball or train yourself to hit a golf ball. Sometimes if you don't have natural talent to do those things, you cannot do them. No matter how much training, how much preparation, whatever your mental state is, it doesn't matter, physical state, running's not one of them. There's not one person out there, I don't care what your body size is, I don't care what your knees feel like, what your hips feel like, what your back feels like. Everyone can do a marathon. Isn't that great to come up with something in your life that you can accomplish? This was my mental, right? This was my mental state. Is there anything that I can do that other people will think is extraordinary that I think is actually ordinary but just requires discipline? Because I'm always testing myself. And this probably comes from childhood. It comes from some sort of trauma. It comes from some sort of experience I had. Who knows what? Where I always feel like I need to prove myself. And that continued through my baseball career when I was always you know, there because of nepotism. How do you stay there? You have to prove yourself and be good always trying to be funny, always trying to be the center of attention, 
all of the things that are my personality traits, always being clean and neat and OCD like, always wanting to more and achieve more and get more and, and be more, always wanting to make the next memory while I'm making the current memory, always looking for the next thing, an adrenaline junkie. All of these personality traits are helpful to marathon running, but not required. The only one that is required, and all you need is the one, it's the discipline. Because when you build up to a marathon, even when you're in marathon shape and you do a four mile run at the end of four miles, you can't go another step. When you're supposed to do seven miles at four miles, you're good. You have three more miles in you. At the end of seven miles, you can't go another step. On marathon day, because you never go above 20 miles during training for a marathon, and if you do, you're not smart. The last six miles, it's muscle memory. They call it the wall. How do you get through the wall? In your job, how do you get through? How do you push through to the next level? How do you get the promotion that you've been trying to get? You push through. The way to push through is to embrace the discomfort. How many of you specifically the minute you feel uncomfortable, stop. Whether you're working out, whether you're in a conversation with a significant other or with a friend, whether you're doing something that you've never done before, whether you're trying to learn a new skill that you don't get immediately and you get a little uncomfortable, you get a little tummy ache, boom, you're done. That's when I start. The feeling of discomfort is what I look for every day. Yes, I use Gaviscon. Yes, I use Tums. Yes, I likely will have an ulcer one day, though I've never had one, because I worry, I think, I overthink, I overprepare, I overplan, I overanalyze. I'm never paralyzed by the analysis, but boy, do I do analysis. Always thinking about the different possibilities, like the flow chart of things that can result from an activity. And marathon running, when you are about to start a run, you have a thing going in your mind, a flow chart. The single most important thing to do before you run a marathon is not stretch. It's not eat. It's not sleep. There's a great expression. You don't need, and I can't take credit for this, but this is a quote that you can put on your wall. You do not need let me, let, me, let me say in the positive way, Coco, ready? Four, six, nine. This is the quote for how to be successful in life and in marathons. It's okay to have sex the night before a marathon. Just don't stay up all night trying. Think about that on a far deeper level than just sex. Think about what's okay for you to do that's uncomfortable. Think about what you do when you get that tummy ache and how you react. For me, the morning of a marathon, the most important thing for me to do is go to the bathroom. And that takes training. It takes knowing your body. It takes repetition. Repetition means how long does it take from eating something to expelling it? I worked with Mike Kill, who's still in baseball. Mike, I'm so sorry. You don't listen to every show, so I hope you're not listening to this. Mike Hill is famous around our organization because he claimed that from eating to crapping, it was under 10 minutes. And I always say to him, how is that possible? Like it could be the previous meal, but I don't think it's physically anatomically possible that you can eat something and boom. And he said, ever been to the halal stand outside the Hilton on 53rd and 6th? And I said, yes. He said, well, that you can just pour right into the toilet. You don't even need to eat it first. Don't eat that before a marathon. Josh Johnston once ate two of those. I think Ricky Nolasco may have also, which is insane. Like one is so ridiculous to eat. And if, especially if you put the spicy sauce on, I'm digressing a little bit. But if you're in New York City, this stand has lines on it at all time. They're open all night long. There's always lines. It's insane. It's so good. And if you had a few drinks or you've gone dancing or whatever you've done the night, you then go eat at this halal stand. It's called the Halal Guys. I think that's what it's called. 53rd and 6th outside the Hilton. Enjoy. You're welcome. So I would time what I would eat and then how long it would take for me to go to the bathroom. Then I would write down and keep track of what I would eat and what that would do during the course of a training run. 
So if I had pizza the night before, how did I feel during the morning run? If I had a hamburger, if I had pasta, whatever I had, how do I feel the next day? What happens to my stomach? The worst nightmare is when you don't get production before a marathon. That means you pee, but you don't take a crap. That means that if you don't get good performance from your tuchus, you're going to have a problem during the race. Well, hi, my name's David, and I've had problems during almost every marathon because I've got a bad stomach. So as much as I've trained, as much as I've kept track, you've got to be prepared during the course of a race that lasts between three and eight hours that something's going to happen, and you have to make an adjustment. My adjustment involves pulling over because no one's paying me to win the race. Everyone gets all caught up. How fast did the pitch go? We have to put pitch clocks up. Pitchers want to know. Fans want to know. Analysts want to know. What's the velocity? What's the exit velocity of that hit? What's the speed of that pitch? Hey, you ran a marathon? What was your time? That's the number one question asked. Why? What, what do you care? What do you mean, what was my time? My time was I finished 26.2 miles. If I said 426 versus 422, are you judging? Oh my God, you did 426? You did five hours and 14 minutes? What, what did you walk? You're damn right I walked, partially. So I have always pulled over to use the restroom. Now, it's a little tricky because, hi, I'm David, I will not use, underline, will not use a porta potty. Let me make sure we're clear, ever. I have never in my life used one of those porta johns for anything other than number one, and I've done that maybe twice because I'm a man, boy, and I can do it anywhere. So if you're not going to use that in the middle of a race, when you hear and feel the gurgle, you start looking for privacy. Like you're in Central Park doing a training run and you go up around 97th Street before 103rd and you look to the left and you see there's baseball fields. No, can't do that. I got to make it a little further. I'm going to do the full loop in, in Central Park. I'm going to get up toward 116th Street. Ah, there's woods to the left. I see my spot pants around your ankles, shoes in front of your butt, and you go to the bathroom. I've done it. It's not a big deal. Water or leaves, and you're on your way. People freak out about going to the bathroom while running. During the Iron Man, I didn't even think of this, Coca. During the Iron Man, you do go to the bathroom while on the bike. I was on the bike for over seven and a half hours as part of the Iron Man in Hawaii, and you have to finish the bike in a certain period of time or else they don't let you start the marathon. So you don't have time to get off the bike and declip. That's when I was going downhill at five miles an hour because the wind was so strong on the Queen K Highway. You have to train how to pee on a bike. That's not easy. Now, it's the same as training to go to the bathroom with your running pants around your ankles. It takes some training. But training to pee on a bike requires you to actually loosen your abdomen. Because if you picture crouching on a triathlon bike, if you're watching this on YouTube, nothing personal with David Sampson, you're in the crouch position. You cannot pee in the crouch position. So you have to get up on your pedals. You have to get up on your hands out of the crouch position. You have to loosen up. And then you get this warm sensation because you're peeing down your leg. And then you feel really relieved. And then your bike smells at the end and you have to wash it. So there are definitely examples, but it's not dramatic. Like your question was, what's dramatic? I don't find that dramatic going to the bathroom. I've seen some dramatic stuff during marathons. I've seen people crawl. I'll tell you the story of my cousin, Joel Sampson. My career best was the New York Marathon in 2010. We wanted to break four hours. I'd never broken four hours. My cousin, Joel, and I were running the entire race together. We're doing serpentine in between people. We're calling out each other's names throughout the 25, 26 miles. Everything's going great. We are looking like we are going to beat four hours. We're at 3.55 as we're heading in back into the park at mile 26 or mile 25.8. We can see the finish line. We are side by side. I cross the finish line at 3.55 something. I look over to hug Joel and he's not there. He went down. He collapsed 10 feet before the finish line. It's on video, it's insane. 
So I've seen some dramatic things. A guy named Harris, one of the great lawyers in our country, is a friend of mine who lives in Florida. We did the Boston Marathon together. He crossed the Boston Marathon finish line. He looked like Santa Claus. He had so much salt that had crystallized on his face, which is what happens when you run in there's certain weather that the sweat actually turns to actual salt. Have you ever licked your arm after a run and it, and it tastes, not that I could ever taste that again. You know what, Coca? I'm gonna do that. I have not licked myself after a run recently because I could see maybe I can taste it. I did something this morning. Hold on, let me see. Nothing. Zero. I mean, I did shower, but nothing. That's so awful. Depressing to still not have taste. Anyway, Harris Siskin, he crossed the finish line with a beard of salt and went right to the medical tent. So there's a whole lot of stuff that happens to go on during the course of marathons. It's pretty dramatic, but guess what? When you finish a marathon, you've had four to eight hours of pain and a lifetime of pleasure. That's how I looked at Ironman training, took a year of my life, and I got to be an Ironman for the rest of your life. When you do something that is out of your comfort zone, you get to celebrate that forever, tattoo or not. Hello, David. Hey, how you doing? With your trip to Africa coming up, what are your top five vacations you took and a memory from each one? So I wanted to answer this question even though there was some concern that it would be a flex, and I don't mean it to be a flex. I've always loved travel, and I've stayed in hostels when I was younger. Uh, people allocate their resources differently. I would always rather spend money on travel than almost anything else because I love the idea of seeing the world. It is intoxicating to me to understand that we are on one planet and there are people so different than I, living so differently than I, so much less fortunate, in some cases so much more fortunate, but just different. I've always understood that the benefits of travel, and I understand that some people do not like to travel because, again, what's the reason people don't travel? I forgot to put that on mute, sorry. Cut that out. Four, six, nine. That was a gulp. The reason why some people don't travel, you're going to say it's financial related, and I'm going to say you can travel and not spend any money at all. So it's not financial. The reason is the stomach ache. There are people who are just want to stay comfortable. They don't want to leave what they know. They are afraid of what they don't know. I embrace what I don't know. So this is not a flex, but I'm going to give you top five vacations. Number five, I went to Melbourne, Australia as part of a group called the Cultural Exchange Club, which is four guys. I'm one of them. And we go to a different sporting event every year since 2006. We went to Melbourne for the Melbourne Cup, which is their version of the Kentucky Derby where you get dressed up, you go watch horse races. We spent time with a friend of my father-in-law's who he had met while traveling, and he was a owner of a winery and a former rugby player. And we were in Melbourne for three days or four days. We met so many interesting people and realized that, wow, we could live in Australia. If there's a place that you have not been and you want to go, Australia, New Zealand. I've not been to New Zealand, but Australia is one of them. And the memory of the Melbourne Cup is realizing that there's a part of the world where you are, it's so different than the United States, but the language is the same. Like when you go to a place where they don't speak English, you can't help but understand the difference, or they don't speak Spanish. You can't help but understand the difference between the US and this place. But when you go to a place that, let's say London, but you say, wait a minute, they're driving on the wrong side. That's a huge difference. Forget the accents because there are plenty of accents in the US. In Australia, they speak English. They do have an accent, the shrimp on the bobby. But everyone there just seems happier, safer. That was the fifth most favorite trip I ever took. Number four, I was lucky enough and smart enough when we signed Ichiro to suggest to our owner, Jeffrey Loria, that we go to Tokyo to introduce Ichiro. The Seattle had never done it. The Yankees had never done it. And Ichiro was very touched by that. And we went to Tokyo, a bunch of us, and we were there for two days. We flew over to introduce him. We didn't sleep the entire time. We went to his press conference, having been up all night, having gone to the fish market, having gone to karaoke, having gone to the Rapungi district, those who know, know. Those who don't, don't. Having gone everywhere, 
pulled into the press conference. I look at a picture of that press conference in the studio here every day where I look bloated and exhausted, but somehow we strapped it on, which is what you do in baseball and in life. Sometimes you just got to strap it on. And I remember looking into Ichiro's eyes, having met him. I had met him telephonically, but this was the first time I'd met him in person. And we realized that we were going to be fast friends. We had so much fun at that press conference. I don't know, Coke, if there's video of that press conference anywhere. The first introductory press conference of Ichiro in Tokyo. But he and I were basically talking the entire time. And PJ Loyello, our head of PR at the time, was so angry because there was so much media. It's like the Beatles. There were hundreds. I'd never done a press conference with more cameras, more people. That was a memorable trip. That was number four. Number three was a trip I took with my kids. I wanted to give them the gift of travel. I have three kids who are 27, 24, and 19. Well, I don't, what do you say when, how old your kids are? I mean, do you say their actual ages the day you're asked the question? Because then it's 19, 24, and 26, because the oldest turns 27 in a month. But that doesn't give you the right indicator of the difference because it's three years between one and two and five years between two and three, which is why I always say three and then five. So I'm telling you 27, 24, and 19. And m many years ago when they were young, we took them to my favorite city, Paris, and to the south of France. And I wanted to show them and teach them about the love of travel. And my wife at the time, the mother of the kids, they... We love to travel. We love to travel and traveled, and we thought it was important for to teach them, like we taught them about charity, like we taught them about family. You do the best you can with your children, and then eventually they become adults and they make their own decisions. But that trip, we took them to the Rodin Museum. We went to the Beaubourg. We went to the Louvre. They saw the Mona Lisa. They saw the Eiffel Tower. They went to the beach in Cannes, but also went to the Picasso Museum, the Leger Museum. We grew up around art. We love art. We wanted the kids to love art. Some kids love it. Some kids don't. It's like telling your kids to love something you love. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But you try not to push it. You don't make fun of your kids for not liking what you want them to like. You accept it. But you put them in position to maybe like what you like. That's what we do as parents of young kids, right? Put them in position to maybe achieve what you've achieved, but more. Maybe like what you like, but start loving. But then acknowledge when they become their own people and make their own decisions. But there was something about that trip and showing them two of my favorite places that felt like the circle of life. And I remember walking on La Croisette in the south of France and just thinking, God, I was that I was there as a 16 year old staying in a youth hostel with not a dollar in my pocket. Couldn't even buy any of the ice cream on the Quasette. Had no spending money, was there studying, had to talk our way into anything that we got that was outside of what we got as part of this program. And now my kids are there. That was my third favorite. Second favorite was something that I did in 2018 when I and a group of 18 of us, 17 of us, went around the world together running seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. It's called the World Marathon Challenge. You start in Antarctica and run a full marathon. Then the next day you run a full marathon in South Africa, which is the African continent. Then the next day you're in Dubai. Then the next day you're in Perth, Australia. Then the next day you're in Lisbon, Portugal. Then the next day, and you're running a marathon each of these days. The next day you're in Cartagena, Colombia. And the next day you're in Miami, Florida. Seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. There's only a couple hundred people in the world who've ever done that. There's more who have run seven marathons over the course of their life, one on each continent. But in seven straight days, only a couple hundred people. As part of that, I helped raise over a million dollars for charity, trying to help lives, trying to help people much less fortunate than I. And I have so many memories from that trip. But the number one memory I have is running the Antarctic Marathon on day one with the race director of the Boston Marathon, a friend of mine named Dave McGilvery, who is a famous runner, a fast runner, and he took the time to run with me the entire four and a half hours that it took me to run the Antarctic Marathon. And the Antarctic Marathon, we ran laps around the runway that our plane landed on. 
They dug a runway out of the ice, landed on ice. Then we ran around the ice four times. It's a six-mile runway plus a hook. Cross the finish line, then get back on a plane and fly to Africa. Crossing the finish line with him and realizing that there were six more marathons in front of us, wondering how that was going to work. There is nothing better than when you have a plan and you don't know how it's going to work because you've planned it, right? It took years to plan this marathon, to plan this trip, to get this group together. It took years to figure out how it was all going to happen, the logistics, and then it was just time to let go. All that was left was to be present and to do it. And at that vacation, that trip, and this is four years ago, I began thinking that not being in the moment was costing me. Always thinking about the next trip, the next memory. It's like families who are at dinner and just talk about the next dinner. Families who have lunch and talk about what are you having for dinner. You're out with your spouse and say, hey, we're having a good trip. What's the next trip? There's plenty of people who do that. I was one of them. My dad used to do that. We'd have family meetings on one trip only to talk about the next trip. Like that'd be the whole conversation. And it was robbing me of the present. When you're doing seven marathons in seven days, you cannot think about marathon five, six, and seven when you're doing marathon one because your body will shut down. You'll cry, literally. And so that was the first vacation, the first trip where I was completely present. And I've tried to emulate that since then. It doesn't work all the time, but I do try. And the number one trip is not a coincidence that I'm going back to Africa here shortly. Because the number one trip is when my family, my dad sent all of us, me and my siblings and our kids on a safari in Africa in 2013. We went to Botswana, Zimbabwe and Cape Town And he was supposed to come with us, but he was too sick. And he did not want to cancel all of our trips because he was unable to go. And so he still let us go. And we went without my dad. We were never really able to take a real trip with him after that. He actually, we tried one other trip and he got sick on it. We had to leave early. God, that's not one of my favorite trips. We went on a cruise before COVID. This was uh, maybe 2017 and he wasn't feeling well and they, We put him in the hospital on the cruise ship, and then I had to take him off in San Juan and spend two days in a hospital with him over New Year's in San Juan. That was not a good trip. But the African safari, I had gone to the Bronx Zoo and the Milwaukee Zoo and zoos and the San Francisco Zoo, I mean the San Diego Zoo. I had never thought about a safari and thought about animals. I'm not a big animal guy. When you go on safari and you are five feet away from an elephant, or you're sitting in a Jeep and you see a lion that's lying down two feet away, or you see Impala and you're so excited day one and by day four, you're like, keep going. We just wanna see death and sex. You look at hippos and you realize that there's an entire world outside of the Lion King. There's an entire world outside of human life that the animal kingdom is absolutely fascinating. It's visceral. You hunt, you eat, you mate. All the things that we do, except we do so many more complicated things because we need money and we need to buy stuff, right? If we had to have shelter, in theory, animals find shelter. They find a way to adapt and live in the heat of Africa. They find trees. Now, we've got a lot of great, benefits from the advances we've made from an evolutionary standpoint. But when you see animals and you start to learn about the jungle and you share that with your kids and you look at their faces while you see their brains working, while you see them learning something, my God, that was impactful. That was out of my comfort zone. My stomach hurt that entire trip. Why? Because I was scared. What's the one thing you don't want to have happen when you're away with your kids right on a safari? Like there's a very simple thing. Don't let your kids get eaten, right? That was my general thought. Like anything that could happen, even if we don't see any of the big five, even if we don't see a kill or something, just if we could possibly leave the safari with the same number of children that we started with, that to me would be a success. The 
first night, elephants actually were right outside of our tents and the kids were totally freaked out. And you're not allowed to leave your tent without security in a safari because you could get eaten. So you have to stay there. And I wanted to stay with Cindy, my wife, not with the kids. So they were all together. And I was like, oh my God, are they, is this it? Are they gonna get dragged away like Max? Where the wild things are? Anyway, thank you. Those are five vacations. I strongly suggest it again, it's not about money. It really is not. Hi, David. Ooh, this is another good list. What are the top five movies you've seen in the last year? Thanks. And then he wrote, or she wrote, ha 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 see, hockey? I think you meant to say, horse hockey. LOL. All right, I watch a movie every day. I review a movie on regular episodes of Nothing Personal. I wanna give you the top five movies I've seen this year. Number five was Red Rocket. Go see Red Rocket, I reviewed it. Remember, that's the one about the kid who grew up in the strip club and it's in Florida. It, no, nothing, Coco won't even see it. Just watch it, Red Rocket, you won't be sorry. Number four, number four could be in the Oscar race coming up, it's called Everything Everywhere All at Once with Michelle Yao. Yo, check it out, you'll enjoy it. Number three was an old movie that I watched this year, but that counts, right? It doesn't have to be a 2022 movie. Phantom Thread, Daniel Day-Lewis's last acting role was a fascinating movie that for whatever reason I had not seen. Red Rocket is in Texas, not Florida. Thank you, Coca. Coca's with me for the mailbag. Do you know that Coca does not get a vacation while I'm on the trip? He wants everyone to remember that. All right, we've said it publicly now. People know. Number two, Licorice Pizza. Philip Seymour Hoffman's son is in Licorice Pizza. And that band, oh God, Coca, what's the band? It's the, it's the uh, lead singer from The Sisters, and she stars in this movie in her first acting role. It's a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. Come on, Coca, go look at Licorice Pizza. And they, they were on Watch What Happens Live, where my daughter works. What, what is the, um, ah, oh, forget it. Anyway, go see Licorice Pizza. Heim, the Heim Sisters, thank you. And the best movie I've seen all year is a movie that was nominated, I believe, for Best International Feature, Best Animated Feature, maybe even Best Director. It's called Flea. Flea is a movie about a man who is fleeing and how he comes to grips with having to leave a war-torn country. If you haven't seen it, you may want to check it out. It's called Flea. Those are the top five movies I've seen. Okay. Hi, David. Hi. How are you? In one of your upcoming mailbags, can you talk about finding the right therapist? You've alluded to having more than one therapist over the years. How do you know when it's time to move on? Could you have asked more questions at the onset of the relationship to better understand whether that therapist was right for you? Thanks. Boy, do I appreciate you asking that question. It's an uncomfortable topic, right? I'm trying to normalize mental health. I'm trying to normalize therapy. People say, yeah, I'm going to physical therapy. I tore my ACL. I got a hip replacement. I'm going to therapy. Well, what happened? What'd you break? No, I'm going to therapy because I don't feel right. Oh, well, what hurts? It's not that it hurts. It's just I've got a lot of things in my head that I'd like to understand better. Ooh, are you crazy? No. I just want to feel better. Why do you go to physical therapy? To feel better. Why do you see a therapist, a mental therapist? To feel better. It's the same thing. I have no idea why they have different connotations. I have no idea why people are embarrassed to say they are in therapy. I embrace the fact that I'm in therapy. I love being in therapy. How great is it to talk to someone who doesn't have a chit in the game? Is it a chip in the game? Is it C-H-I-T or C-H-I-P? You ever have those things where you say an expression and you're not exactly sure whether the expression is right? Like, hey, I'll play it by ear. Is it I'll play it by ear or I'll play it by ear? I always say I'll play it by ear. I do say for all intents and purposes, not intents like spies like us, intent like what's your intention and purpose. Some people say for all intensive purposes because they mishear intents and purposes. Is it... 
a chit in the game, Coca, or a chip in the game? Because it could be a chip like a poker chip. And I've always thought like, hey, a chit is like a, like a, I don't know what the definition of chit is. But they've got, they don't have one, right? Therapists are there for one reason only. They are there to be a neutral observer to your issues, right? They are there to tell you chits. Okay, Coca, let's stop. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to read this. Chits are small cardboard pieces, often squares, that represent things in a game. They can represent resources, currency, victory points, or even troops. Hell yeah. So it is chits in a game. So therapists don't have a chit in the game. They want to help you. It's sort of like going to a medical doctor. What exactly chit in the game do they have? I mean, they don't want to get sued for malpractice, but neither do therapists. They want to help you fix your leg, your broken leg, or your hip, or your knee. Right? The reason I embrace therapy is that who am I to think that I'm completely evolved and understand everything about my body and my brain? That's like me trying to self-diagnose every physical injury I have. What do I need to, I don't need to go see a doctor. Oh, I've got something in my ear. Oh, let me go get antibiotics because I'm a doctor. Oh, I've got a torn hamstring. I know what to do. I don't need to go to physical therapy or go get an MRI or see a doctor. What's the difference? When you know that you're sad or you know that you're not reacting right in a situation, you've got frustration tolerance issues, you've got anger issues, you've got rage issues, you've got depression, you've got OCD, you've got body dysmorphia, you've got this unbelievable issue with your childhood, like whatever the case may be, what makes you think that you can deal with that yourself? Oh my God, I have a compound fracture, no problem, I got it. I'm gonna put the tourniquet on, I'm gonna set it and I'm gonna plaster it myself. Lawyers aren't even supposed to represent themselves as clients, unless you're an idiot. And that's not even something physical or mental. So I am perfectly okay seeking help. It's a process. When you sit down with a therapist, and I've had many of them because you're right, it's hard to get the right one. And the equivalent is when something's wrong with you and you get different medicines, let's say you have cancer and God forbid, but people have it unfortunately, and you have cancer and you go on a medicine and it doesn't really cure you or help you. And so you try another medicine and then another medicine and then another and another, or you go to a doctor, God, I need a second opinion. My head still hurts or my hip still hurts. So you go to another doctor. That is totally normal. Why do people not realize that with therapists, it's the same thing? You go to a therapist and if you don't feel there's a connection, if you don't feel that that person is someone you are free to open up to, if you're lying to your therapist, if you're attracted to your therapist, if your therapist attracted to you, find another one. There should be an app like Coca came up with this. And I'm going to give him total credit, like an app like Tinder for therapists where you can swipe right when it's someone and then have a quick meeting, a quick something say, oh, you're right for me. Let's go on a second date. Let's see if we can maybe go all the way. Of course, going all the way with the therapist does not mean having sex. It means revealing things that are so deep inside you that you don't like talking about them. You don't want to tell them or anybody what's really in your head, that you have this defense mechanism to answering questions. If you are not fully answering a question when asked, it means you need a new doctor, a new therapist. Go to a, go to a medical doctor. Hey, does anything hurt? No, I'm fine. Um, well, your bone is sticking out of your calf. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, you may need a new doctor. So one of the things you do when you have a therapist is there's tests that you do to see whether or not it is a good relationship. When they are giving you coping mechanisms to things or a roadmap to improvement and you do not follow that roadmap, get a new therapist. When you do follow that roadmap and it doesn't lead to the relief that you are seeking, get a new therapist. If that therapist is telling you there's a process and you are engaged in that process, Stay with the therapist until the process is over, because if you're not at the end, then how can you evaluate whether the route and the process was correct? You have to give things a chance. It's like taking a Tylenol when you're hungover and saying, I don't understand why I don't feel better, like right now. 
Well, you got to wait for the Tylenol to work. You got to wait for it to work its way into your system. It's the same thing with a therapist. They've got to work their way into your system. Some interesting questions that you can ask. You can ask about whether or not how quickly they, oh my God, what's the word? Diagnose, thank you. How many sessions will it take to diagnose? How many sessions will it take to show me a route or a path? What is your specialty? I'm here to talk about parent issues. I'm here to talk about child issues. I'm here to talk about work issues. What is it that your specialty is? Why would you go to a cardiologist when you've got foot fungus? You wouldn't. Some therapists have different specialties. You can figure out what their specialties are either from a website or through conversation. Doctor, I don't even know where to begin. Well, I don't either. Just start. That may not be your jam. Your jam may be, I don't know where to begin. Please tell me. And you need a therapist to start digging things out of you. Well, tell me about your day. Tell me about your, what. Tell me about your worst day in eighth grade. Tell me about the best day of your life. Tell me about the worst day of your life. If that's something that touches you, if that's something that feels right, stick with it. I just want to, I want to end this, Coca, and I want to say this about therapy. I don't know where we are in 40 minutes. I didn't write it down. I'm trying to go 40 minutes here for you guys today on this mailbag. I just would say... The only way to feel better, both mentally and physically, and that's been the theme of this show, is you have to do something. Nothing's just going to happen to you. Sitting on your couch, not ever wanting to feel uncomfortable, get out of your comfort zone, not wanting to deal with the skeletons in your closet or the things that make you who you are, both mentally and physically, if you're not satisfied, If you're not fulfilled with the way you are right now, you're going to be that way tomorrow, but you can change it today. It's the back to the future time continuum. Whatever you do today will impact tomorrow and the next day and the next month and the next year and the rest of your life. You don't need to be in pain physically. You don't need to be in pain mentally. You don't need to be satisfied you can achieve. And I'm not trying to be Tony Robbins. I'm not trying to motivate you because I can't. It's not going to be someone else who gets you to run a marathon. It's not going to be someone else who gets you to take care of yourself mentally by going to a therapist. It's just going to be you. Are you willing to? The sun will come up tomorrow. Who knows what the tide could bring? Maybe it'll bring your discomfort right to the surface and you'll start dealing with it and embracing it and loving it wait to see we'll see you next time thanks for being here